So today we are recording the Holocaust Memorial Remembrance. Um, and it was in memory of Dr. Stanley Robin because this was his, um, his dream basically of educating the public about the Holocaust and what it meant. And um, never to forget the slaughter of 6 million Jews and their brothers uh, in the Nazi genocide. Um, Dr. Stanley Robin, his theme was basically never to forget. He was born Semek Rubinstein in Poland in 1914. He was a young doctor and he actually worked in the enamelware factory run by Schindler because everybody knows Schindler's list, of course, but there really was no list. But he was in uh, the Amalia factory and basically he was then with his brothers um, sent to Mauthausen and he was in that camp until they were liberated in 1945. He came to the United States and began his journey in Long Beach in 1956. The memorial that was dedicated on June 7th, 1987, it was his um, selection of Monty Lieber, who was our architect um, in Long Beach at the time, who was chosen amongst uh, many people, and I think as people were as far as Jerusalem who submitted uh, ideas and plans for this memorial, but Mr. Lieber, of course, was chosen, and that is the memorial that we have on our grounds today at City Hall in Long Beach. The honorary um, guests at this first public breakfast was to raise money for the memorial at Temple Israel, and um, this is Jerry Crema, Matthew McCarthy, Robert I. Link, Jerry Kramer, Paul Wheel, Dr. Stanley Robin, Alfred DeVello, and Joseph S. King. Dr. Nathan Selnick was a great contributor for the memorial. He donated $100,000 in his, uh, his wife's memory. He was also a resistance fighter during the war when he was overseas. <laughs> The Holocaust Memorial Dedication. The Holocaust Memorial was planned for Long Beach City Hall, and this is a rendering from the newspaper Newsday, November 19, 1984. Dr. Stanley Robin and Monty Lieber were on the independent voice. Um, they made front page and this is from March 1st, 1984. And of course it he is holding the, um, I guess you call that a rendition, a small rendition of your monument. It's a model. It's a model. Okay. Right. Thank you. And of course this beautiful little girl is his daughter um, and she's standing in front of the memorial and that's beautiful. Okay, this first picture, Mr. Leeper, welcome to our program today. Um, I'm glad to have you um, at the library's program today. And could you just tell us a little bit about the slide? Well, this is a slide of the uh, part of the plans uh, that I developed for the submission for the, uh, uh, it was a competition to design the Holocaust Memorial as an international design competition. Um, as you mentioned, there were people as far away as Jerusalem, there was, there were, uh, people from California uh, and Florida, and uh, I was flattered to have been the one selected. Um, this slide is um, part of the, the bench area? Correct. This is a cross-section of the bench areas for the, um, the meditation benches. I love all the detail. And this is a rendition. This is a cross-sectional detail. This is the, the sheet that basically showed uh, how the monument was to be constructed. Um, it's required on any job that we would do. Right, of course. Well, that's, that's very, very detailed for me because I don't know much about being an architect, but it's amazing like to see the details and all the, the drawings and of course your notes as specifications, correct? Yeah. Correct. And this is... Oh. This is uh, the plaza plan that showed the location of the monument, uh -huh. and it had to be 
uh, discussed uh, after being presented with the uh, uh, city board at City Hall. And originally on the base of the benches were going to be the names of the uh, main camps that were part of the uh, Holocaust. There were thousands of camps, but right. these, these were the main, the main camps. Ones. Yes, mm -hmm. I recognize some of the names, not all of them, of course. And these are depictions of the panels uh, as I originally designed them for the, the uh, monument. Um, and they've rarely been seen uh, because um, uh, they were substituted with other panels based upon uh, a uh, clarification. I was, I, it really, it was a change in uh, the scope as far as what the monument was going to represent. So this was the original depictions that were part of the uh, competition. Yeah. So what I'm going to do now is these are blown up from that depiction of each part of the, um, the plan, which this is beautiful because from the from looking on top, this is basically the Jewish star. Am it's I a star, David, but star unfortunately, David. Uh, part of the, uh, I'll call it editing, that was done uh, by the committee and by Dr. Robin, uh, they didn't want it to be uh, kind of in your face, too Jewish, uh, to be looking down from City Hall. So they, they truncated the points uh, on the paving that was on the ground. Mm -hmm. And I originally didn't know that this was going to go on a hard plaza uh, where I actually would have had this paving done anyway. But so you can see that the rendering I rendered in the grass because yeah. I expected it was going to go into a grassy area. Yeah. They didn't actually specify where the original monument was going to go. Right. And this is a depiction uh, from an actual photograph uh, of a mother and son who had just been basically browsed from their um, home uh, by the Germans, and they were standing uh, with their hands in the air uh, in kind of a, a desperate uh, look. Um, what, what I was depicting when we uh, originally were asked to do something uh, in memory of the Holocaust, I was depicting something that I was hoping would be for generations, um, since we were probably, uh, as time went on, going to forget uh, how horrible it was and the treatment of, of uh, individuals, human, human beings by other human beings, uh, that I, I wanted people, in, and especially to see children, and the sense of fear of being overtaken by, uh, by their own countrymen. Yeah. That's, it's hard to get a understanding of the horror, and there's no words to describe that. And, and the panels are really portraying what they're feeling, because it's like, you know, you know, they're putting their hands up and it's a little, a little boy and like, why? You're, let's, you're under arrest for what? What did we do? Right, and, and the, the sense of fear uh, was so prevalent, obviously. And this was a depiction um, actually also taken from a photograph of the back of a figure, a human figure. And it's sad to even call somebody who had a personality and a soul uh, and a life, uh, a figure, but uh, to see them etched uh, their, the lines in their body because of how they starved them. Yeah. They literally starved them. And, and so this was really a depiction of the human suffering. Yeah. And definitely so. And this was a depiction of, uh, because I don't know that people would remember the uniforms that they were forced to wear uh, and the fact that they were forced to wear this triangle uh, with the um, uniform in, uh, it was an inverted triangle, which by the way is what you see as the shape that that man in that uniform is uh, etched into, which was the inspiration for the design of the monument. Uh, it was one of the inspirations. Uh, I had um, been raised by a former GI who was actually a liberator of one of the camps. And he saved the lives of two people who ended up being instrumental in the history of the Holocaust. One was a, a young boy. They were both uh, 16. They were teens. They were both, they were, one was 16, one was 17 years old. Uh, one went on to be the uh, official artist and he became an artist. He was the official artist for the uh, Nuremberg trials mm -hmm. uh, and Eichmann, the Eichmann trial. Um, and the other one became a, a chief rabbi 
in Israel um, and the chief rabbi of Ashdod uh, in Israel. Right. Um, and this was a depiction uh, later on because I was asked to do different renderings. And these were two girls basically behind the, the barbed wire. Um, the other thing I was going to say about the triangle right. was that um, I had been a student in an architecture school in a school run by the Vatican in Florence, Italy. And I got a chance to travel, uh, especially when school was over. And finally, I wanted to go to Germany. I met a, a, a girl, um, Ingrid, uh, who was uh, lived in Munich. And she invited me uh, after uh, we both were studying in Florence. She was studying art. And I found her one day in a, um, a cloister where she invited me uh, to come further in where she had special permission and she was doing a study uh, on uh, special paintings um, that were done using an egg uh, uh, format. Um, they had been preserved for 500 years. And um, she was, so she was studying in this cloister. And um, so I got to know her, you know, through being such a nice, uh, you know, very intent artist. She invited me, so I went to Munich and I, I didn't realize that only a few blocks from her home were uh, these stone walls and she asked what I like to see Dachau, the camp, the concentration camp. It was right there in the neighborhood. What I was fascinated by was when I went into this camp, which was preserved as a museum, you could drop a pin, you could hear a pin drop because it, nobody spoke. You went from exhibit to exhibit and there was, there was no speaking at all. I think everybody was in shock and, and in awe. And there was even a film, a silent film, uh, that was made by the troops um, and uh, General Eisenhower was in the film. And you see the look of horror because he made the residents of Munich walk through the camp after it was being uh, liberated. And they still saw the remnants of bodies and, and um, the horror of, of the Holocaust. And I especially remember the look on um, some of the women's faces uh, as they were uh, putting their hands to their mouths. Um, but, and what, what really shocked me was with the smell of the, the, uh, the humans being burned and the, and the smell coming out of the chimneys right in their own neighborhood, that they never uh, said anything. They never responded uh, to this. And, and so I guess my surprise was the fact that they looked horrified, considering they must have known what was going on. And this was literally in their own neighborhood, only a few blocks from their established houses. At so that point, how could you say something if you're at risk to lose your own life because you're being uh, too nosy or knowing the truth and saying something you're you're as good as dead well i understood that yeah and For the, I, especially the civilian people not the soldiers but the civilians who lived in the neighborhood but i guess they really didn't have an idea i guess it was kept from uh, it seemingly was kept from them yeah. so this these triangles uh represented the triangle that was on the uniform. That was my original uh, impression. And then uh, I realized that the triangle also represented something else. If you look at it carefully, if you ever tried to balance something like that on its point, it's almost impossible, if not impossible. And so I looked at the fact that if I could invert that triangle, there's a sense of balance that was disturbed in the world. And there's a sense of hope that something on its point, balanced like this, could stay up and not fall down because we are always basically a, a breath of wind, a, you know, a wisp of wind away from seeing something like this happen again. And so that was the whole purpose of the triangle inverted. The other thing about the triangle, um, and this, this whole monument assembled is a tetrahedron on its point. That's what it's, the shape is called. And that tetrahedron also represented the fact that the triangle is the strongest form in nature. And it was used uh, extensively by uh, Richard Buckminster Fuller, who designed the uh, geodesic dome. And I had the opportunity while I was in college, I was in my, uh, probably, uh, I was probably 20 years old. And I believe he was around 93. And I got a chance to meet him and speak with him and, uh, and to get more of an idea about the concept of the use of the triangle and the fact that in nature, it's used uh, by insects and birds and, and uh, almost every species 
uh, as a way to, to build uh, their, their homes and, and structures um, because it's the strongest form in nature. So we've seen the- And you, you see how we, I inverted the, uh, the colors in the panels yes. because we were going, I proposed that this be done in black granite and the granite was actually done, uh, this was black granite from uh, Vermont. It's beautiful. And then this is what it ultimately became when it was finally built. Uh, and I was there at each stage as the panels were being brought off of the trucks. Um, and there were special attachment methods uh, that were used in order to hold those panels in place mm -hmm. on a steel frame. And you can see the fragility, the idea that this thing could topple. Right. And yet, it it truthfully, is it doesn't because it it's, actually uh, it was built very strongly. Uh, it, beautiful. I had built it, believe it or not, to resist a flood. Oh, that's a great idea. And if you live by the water. Thank goodness it did. Yes. Cool. So this would have been how it would have looked if they had not changed the panels. Right. And this is... It's just amazing. Notice um, it also was elevated. Yeah, right, because um, I see it's built up here. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and then I was asked to do a rendering. Um, this actually created some controversy that no one would have imagined. But poor Dr. Robin, um, who fancied himself to be an amateur artist, um, uh, argued with me about this uh, rendering because he couldn't imagine that this monument would, would look bigger than City Hall. And I tried to explain to him that this is because in perspective, things that are closer to you appear larger. And I even asked him to hold his thumb to his face in front of his eyes so that he could see that his thumb was bigger than the piano across the room because it was closer to him in perspective. Right. And he kept stating to me that, well, everybody knows that a thumb is not as big as a piano. Right. And I, I finally just, I gave up. This was the you know, rendering, because he wanted me somehow to make it almost dot-sized uh, relative to the building in the background. I, I couldn't do that. I, it, was, it, was against, it was against nature. I mean, you can see in this reality picture, right. the real thing, it's yeah. definitely as big as it would have been uh, had it been um, uh, in that rendering, well, the way it was in the rendering. Okay, so let's go on the next one. So now we could talk about the, what the present day is and what is actually on the memorial is not what you submitted, it's not what you drew, it's not what you planned, and basically um, was totally changed, um, which is kind of tragic in a way because it really portrayed what the Holocaust was about. It showed the fear. It showed the, the gentleman, like basically his bones coming through his skin, even though it's an etching, it's, it's like, it shows you the, right. the, the destruction of his body. So that is not of course portrayed on what the current memorial holds. So this first panel was changed to um, the memory and eternal in memory, of course, of the 1 million Jewish children who perished and the gentleman who um, <clears throat> they're speaking about, I didn't really know too much about him until I started doing this project. And I did actually read two of his books. Um, he was a Polish Jewish educator and um, he basically declined his freedom to care for these orphans. And in 1942, he was boarded on a train with his children to Treblinka with 13 members of his staff and they were sent to the gas chambers. So this is in his memory and of those children who walked that mile. Um, now, Janusz Korczak was not Jewish. Right, he was um, Polish. And he was given, as you said, he was given the opportunity to escape. And he said, I cannot leave these children. Um, interestingly enough, um, and I was, I was young, I was 24 years old. Um, and Dr. Robin was much older than me and retired at this point, um, a retired physician. And uh, he, uh, he only shared with me what he wanted to share. So what happened was that the, I didn't know that the panels had been changed until right before they were delivered. Of course, I was stunned uh, at what had happened because um, apparently the committee was concerned that the 
uh, public would not receive this well in a public place if it seemed like it was all one-sided, that it was um, uh, something having to do with Jews. Um, the frustration with that was that uh, it was very clear that uh, the Germans had no problem with the fact that they labeled these people and uh, publicly humiliate them, beat them, uh, starve them. Uh, and it was all because they were Jewish. And yet the monument was now going to depict, uh, it, it had taken a complete turn. Dr. Robin suddenly came up with a whole story about the righteous Gentiles um, who had saved uh, people in the Holocaust, which I take nothing away from because this was a very noble thing that uh, Oscar Schindler did and that Janusz Korczak, uh, I mean, this was, uh, this was like, these were people who were angels amongst, amongst uh, others who were being so cruel. Um, and I, I take nothing away from that. I think that was an, an incredible story. Each of these was an incredible story, but I guess the fact that the federal government stepped in uh, through Senators Alphonse D'Amato and uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, um, and together got the funding to, uh, to, to close the gap. We had 100,000 from uh, um, Dr. Uh, uh, Selnick. Selnick. Yes. I didn't want to mispronounce his name. I met Dr. Selnick. He was a very nice man. Yes, he's really, got a beautiful story attached to him as well. I'm such a good heart. Next program. He was really, he was a special person. Um, and I really appreciate it. I and mean, he, he put his arm around me and, and, uh, and spoke to me like uh, he was my father. And uh, I really, I was very appreciative of the warmth. As uh, the senators also were very, very uh, warming about this whole thing. They, were, they really, um, I guess they were a little impressed that I was so young at the time. Uh, but um, they, uh, they both took me aside to tell me uh, you know, their impressions of the monument while we were waiting for the, the uh, program, the original program to dedicate it, to begin. Um, it was long ago enough that that three-year-old, my oh, that was my older daughter. Yeah. My younger one was only a few months old in a stroller. Oh, wow. Actually, she was, I think, only a, about six weeks old. Um, and uh, they're both now in their 30s. Uh, the, my three-year-old is uh, now 36. Um, so this has been a few years. Yes, but um, all the same. Um, I did, when I thought this program through, I they came to this because I sit at this, memorial quite often um, I take my son because he's got a Pokemon spot and so while he's doing the Pokemon thing I sit at the memorial and basically I sit there and pray and you know think about what it represents and it just gave me an idea for a program and I was like you know what people pass here every day and they don't have any idea what this is they have no idea about the people who've died they really don't know anything they just say, what is that? And I'm like, oh my God, how could you not know that? I sit there every day, I pass here every day, I grew up here. And this was um, a quite welcoming thing for me, even though it's painful, it's welcoming to me because it's peaceful and it's a peaceful place for me. And so um, I love it, I appreciate it. And I'm glad that even though it's not what you, would, you know, wanted it to be, and I can understand Dr. Robbins you know, what he wanted to do. He, he made some changes because he felt that he had to. That's kind of sad because we're supposed to be living in a, a present world where we're supposed to have more understanding. But I guess it is what it is and we can't change that. But our program today is enlightening us of your design and what you wanted. It would have been beautiful either way. I would have sat there. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. And so in this panel too, it tells you about the Christian brothers and he does talk about Kolbe, Schindler and Wallenberg. Of course, all of those people were not all Jewish or Germans. This young man was a Swedish architect and he was an architect as well. So he has something in common with you. Um, he basically also did a lot. He was a humanitarian. And um, of course, Schindler, Dr. Robin himself was in his, his Imalia camp. It wasn't really a camp, it was a factory. And basically on his grave, it wrote the unforgettable lifesaver of 1200 persecuted Jews. So he tried in his own way to save people. But of course, again, in how much can you do in a time when they basically came to this 
first we'll just tell all the Jews to leave. But then when no one was able to leave, then they just started to kill everybody, which is the basic bottom line is they had a plan to just exterminate everyone. And um, which is still so incredible today that yes. anybody could have been or any group of people could have been so heartless yeah. uh, to, to their fellow man. Exactly. And the gentleman Woman. here, of course, is a Catholic priest who actually they did saint him. Um, he was also a Polish Catholic priest and a friar, and he sheltered uh, Jewish uh, people from the Nazis and the Gestapo. Um, basically, he was imprisoned and he saw a gentleman crying out loud that please, he didn't want to die. And he basically changed places with him and he gave up his life for him. So, I mean, it doesn't sound like somebody would say, well, why would you do that? Well, sometimes people make decisions because they feel in their heart and in their soul that this is something they need to do. And it's, you have to have a lot of strength to like go to your death knowing. But in his heart, he was like, I'm going to save somebody who's scared someone who has fear. And I, I respect that tremendously. And now we're going to talk about Stan Leeper. Right. My father, who I dedicated this monument to personally because of his dedication. Uh, I, I mentioned he was a GI who was a, a liberator, uh, one of the liberating troops um, at uh, Gunskirchenlagen, which was a feeder camp of uh, Bergen-Belsen. And um, he wrote a story, which I know is part of this narrative uh, that you have in, sl in slides, that um, about the day uh, or two leading up to the actual liberation of his camp and how these two young boys uh, had uh, come to him while he was um, standing guard duty. Um, and they had taken German uniforms uh, from a boxcar. What had happened was, uh, the, as the Germans were leaving this camp, knowing uh, that they were under attack and that they were uh, going to be overrun by the American and British troops that were coming together in that area of Belgium. Um, they, uh, uh, they, they were shooting, the Germans were shooting everybody that they could find. They were, they were also shooting and killing uh, the cattle and they were using flamethrowers. They, they burned the trees, they burned all the crops, they burned everything that they could. They, um, they, my father said that as, the, as they, uh, they were on uh, troop transports headed toward the camp, uh, he looked out and he said it looked like the moon. There was nothing alive. He said they saw the remnants of dead pigs and, and chickens and, and every, the, the Germans slaughtered everything. Somehow these two boys had hid uh, under a, a, a bunch of debris next to a boxcar. And when the Germans had finally left uh, they, and they could tell that it was quiet, they went into the box cars. They uh, they managed to find uniforms that didn't fit them. They were they were so skinny. They were so emaciated that the, the uniforms hung on them. And there they were, as my father was standing guard duty the night before they went into the camp. Um, and these two figures are coming up the road in German uniforms, no less. My father my father was just eighteen. He had just turned eighteen, and um, here he was. I mean, imagine you leave high school. And a month and a half later, you're in Germany holding a rifle. And he sees these two. My father in the 71st in Infantry was um, the chosen one to communicate with uh, the people uh, as they would go from town to town, they would billet. They would take the people's uh, uh, homes and the troops would basically have a place to sleep. My, father's, my father was the only one who spoke German um, and he spoke fluent German. And he would go from door to door and he would you know, knock to tell the people they had to evacuate for the, German, for the American troops to take their homes temporarily. So there he was um, on this road and he yells in German to these two figures approaching him. He raises his rifle and says to get down on the ground, to halt and get down on the ground. And they were Czechoslovakian, but they understood German. They listened and they got down on the ground. And now they're, uh, they're crawling toward him uh, as he's walking toward them. And he hears them speaking Yiddish to each other. And they're basically saying, oh my God, after everything we've been through, now we're going to be killed um, because they think we're Germans. And my father heard them speaking Yiddish. And my father was raised in a household where his parents spoke Yiddish. 
So he knew Yiddish fluently. As a matter of fact, he, ta he taught it uh, later on. And uh, so he started to speak to them in Yiddish. And I get a little uh, uh, misty uh, at this point because um, they, uh, they spoke back to him and, and said, you, you speak Yiddish? Am I, and they, they, you're Jewish? My father pulled out his uh, prayer book, his US government official Jewish prayer book. And he handed it to them to show them. And they were looking through it and, and they couldn't believe it. They said, oh my God, we found an angel. We found someone. And he took them, um, he put them um, in a, a, he took them to the room that he had for himself. He, when he got off guard duty, he had gone to his sergeant. Um, unfortunately, and this was interesting, at the age of eight years old, at the dedication of the Orlando Public Library where we were living at the time, somehow across the street, a man smiled at my father and they walked to the middle of the street. I followed my father and he introduced me to his former sergeant from uh, the Second World War. And uh, the, I remember the sergeant saying to me, I'm eight years old. And he says, uh, isn't it amazing uh, what your father and I did for those two boys? And uh, we walked away and my father mumbled. He said, you know what his sergeant said? His sergeant said, send them back up the road to the camp and we'll get them tomorrow when we uh, liberate the camp. He had no idea what was going on. They heard the gunfire, they saw the flames in the distance, and he was gonna send them back uh, up the camp, up the road to the camp. My father instead had taken them and to his, his put one of them was so emaciated, uh, he put him in a baby crib, 16 year old boy in a baby crib, the other one uh, in the bed, and my father slept on the floor that night. And the following day, uh, after they liberated the camps, came back and he put them in a Jeep and he went AWOL and he drove them overnight to a Red Cross hospital. Um, and uh, I remember the story that one of them, we met uh, Yehuda Bakan, one of the two men. Uh, and I was probably already at this point, 16 or 17. And uh, he told me that I was about his age when, when he met my father and that my father taken them into this hospital and the doctor, the head doctor told my father that and my, again, my father was only 18 years old. Um, the doctor told my father that he couldn't take any more people. They, the hospital was full. And my father held this man by his neck against the wall. He pushed him against the wall and he threatened him. And he said, I'm leaving them in your care. Uh, they they are, both had diphtheria. They both uh, had typhus. They, they, uh, they were sick uh, and dying. And he said, um, I'm going to come back uh, in another day or so, and they better be here, and you better be giving them care. And um, the hospital actually took care of them. The, the doctor was nicer to my father the next time, uh, and he uh, found them beds, and they survived, obviously. Um, and they accredited my father with, uh, with the fact that ultimately he, uh, he rescued them in that sense and uh, was able to give them up at that time even giving them, uh, the, the, the American troops were giving uh, prisoners uh, chocolate. Uh, their, their stomachs couldn't handle it. And some died on the spot yeah. uh, from, uh, from some of the things that were given to them by the troops. So my father was very concerned about uh, their, their care and he came to see them several times uh, while he was still in his unit in the 71st Infantry. Um, so uh, you'll see that that certificate was actually signed uh, both um, Ellie Wiesel, who came uh, from New York City, and um, uh, the famous Nazi hunter, um, uh, Simon uh, Wiesenthal, came from the Wiesenthal Center in Los Angeles. They actually met and took a car together from Detroit. They flew into Detroit, and they came to the synagogue that uh, we were in in Toledo, Ohio, and there was a special uh, occasion, and, and, uh, um, where the whole community came together and they and they uh, presented my father with that certificate uh, signed by both of them for uh, his work in, in helping to save uh, human lives um, so Great which was a it was a very meaningful thing in my life I was at that point uh, in college and I'd come home from college for that um, so that's why I dedicated uh, the monument to to the memory of my father yeah 
and rightly so, beautiful job. And he wrote a beautiful article, of course, that we see here about Wolfgang and Yehuda. And the next slide um, you provided is, uh, is the, the, she's the rabbi? Yes, this is, um, uh, uh, in uh, this is, I don't know what uh, how old he was. He was probably in his 60s at this point. But this was um, uh, Wolfgang, uh, who became the chief rabbi of Ashdod. Um, and his, he had changed his name, uh, Sinai Adler. Uh, he changed his name to, it was Wolfgang Adler. Um, uh, and uh, actually my brother was invited at one point to um, a wedding of his son. My brother had settled in Israel and it was typical to wear all white to a wedding. So my brother dressed in all white to go to this wedding. He was the only one in the wedding who wasn't wearing the black coat and the black hat. Um, he had a beard, but that's, that was his choice. And uh, he went to the wedding and of course they shunned him at the wedding because he wasn't one of them. And in the middle of the wedding, uh, Rabbi Adler stopped the music, stopped everything and said, uh, motion my brother, who at that point was in his twenties. And he said, come forward. He introduced everybody to them. And he said, if it weren't for this uh, young man's father, none of you would have even been here for this occasion or any other occasion um, because I may have perished and none of you would even be here. And of course, they warmed up to him at that point. Um, but there were a lot of, our lives were intertwined uh, for, uh, for years, for decades. And then of course, on the base of the bottom of the, one of the granite panels is all the uh, plaques and it was hard taking pictures there. But I was able to get this one, of course, is about uh, the original design by Stanley Robbins because he replaced your original designs. Um, and then, of course, uh, the monument erection uh, erected with the advice and consent and support of the city officials of Long Beach back in 87. Um, and this lists all of city council, uh, Judge Tepper, um, Ed Eatman, Hannah Kamenoff, Bruce Nyman, Harvey Wiesenberg. Stanley Smolkin, Bruce Bergman, Pearl Weil, and Kevin Bradish. And of course, there we go. Concept and design and structure of the monument, original creation of the architect, Monty Lee, for whom we have the pleasure of uh, speaking with us today. And the memorial, uh, Holocaust Memorial of Long Island, um, which is the committee that Stanley Robin did um, originate. And with the help of the vice presidents and the treasurer and Mr. King, they were able to um, succeed in building the monument in City Hall. Of course, Dr. Nathan Selnick um, donated the hundred thousand um, dollars in memory of his wife, and they were both resistance fighters during the war. I should mention that the hundred thousand that Dr. Selnick uh, contributed was an amazing uh, feat. There was no. Uh, money at that point. I don't think they'd even raised uh, twenty five or thirty thousand yeah. um, dollars. And then the federal government, which I think was what caused the committee to sort of water the uh, design down. Um, the federal government uh, had uh, then kicked in another hundred and fifty thousand because the monument was uh, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars at the time. Yeah, I don't think they expected it to be that much originally. They had had a different amount. And it was, I guess, costs were growing um, as they started, you know, getting everything together. Well, interestingly enough, I don't think, I think I surprised them when I showed them that we had to have the benches and the monument uh, with foundations. They didn't expect even, they didn't understand right. that without those foundations, be able to support the well, not only would it not support the weight, but there's a, an effect that takes place in really cold weather where the, the ice crystals in the ground, when they freeze, they expand. Yeah. So the whole monument would have been heaving and moving up and down and, and it would not have been stable. Yeah, that, that's, that's a very interesting point. Cause I don't even think of that when you're looking at a marble structure, but yes, that's the same reason why the bridges fall from contraction with weather. Absolutely. So that's, yeah, that's very, very true. And um, your expertise, um, of course, it's still there. Um, which is, <laughs> it's, it's still there and it's beautiful. And after Sandy, they had some uh, guest restoration work done on it. And um, in our next program, we'll be talking about uh, some more people like Dr. Selnick and um, some Holocaust survivors that were uh, living in Long Beach for their lifetime. 
And um, so I can't thank you enough for joining us today. Um, this has been an, a remarkable program and when uh, I'm just glad that we were able to do this today. And I thank you so much for joining You're us. You're welcome. And from the Long Beach Public Library and myself, um, we thank you very much. You're and welcome. You have a thank beautiful you. day and uh, we'll talk to you very soon. Thank you. Have a good day.